All right, welcome to another episode of Untherapeutic. Today we have Richard Skinner. Uh, Richard is the executive director of Sapphire Therapy. It's a local nonprofit here in Houston. But but I tell you, Richard is a unicorn. He's another black therapist here in the city. And so that's super important because people always ask me, hey, you know, is there any other therapist that you recommend? Nine out of 10 times, <clears throat> I send it to Richard because I trust what he does. I trust his work. And I used to work for him. So, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of coming full circle uh, that we're, we're here on the podcast to, today. Very interesting topic. But Rashad, tell us a little bit more about yourself. How did you get into being a therapist? Uh, being a therapist is always kind of, I thought it was something, well, I guess I should say the mind has always been interesting. <clears throat> not, a, not therapy so much, but when I went to college, um, I got a degree in psychology and I got out. There was no money for a bachelor's in psychology. That That is not a myth. There's no money in bachelor's. So I went back to grad school and uh, I decided to be a therapist because being with a bachelor's in psychology, bachelor's in psychology I was like a caseworker and I could see mm-hmm. send my clients to like therapists. And uh, a lot of times I could see what they were doing. I mean, I couldn't see it, but you know, I kind of got the vibe of I'm on the wrong end of mental health. <laughs> yeah. you know, case manager the wrong I was, I was a case worker you definitely at the start point yeah yeah you're at the start point right right <laughs> and you know while i'm there people say no oh man a black if you were a black therapist you know you'd be write your own check blah 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 you know and this kind of got me gassed up and then after that that was a selling point but that wasn't the thing that got it going the thing that really got me going was i could see that a lot of therapists would use theory and handouts for the African American community, and it doesn't doesn't relate, doesn't roll over mm-hmm. to these black families as much as they think they do. And they told me that when I was in school too. They were like, you know, history has shown that psychology comes from a European perspective mm-hmm. that doesn't apply to the Afrocentric neighborhood. And so, I feel I go back and be one of those type of therapists. And when I got out here, I started to realize that. Um, Black folks would go to church, put a lot in the church. And a lot of people would not go to therapy simply because they go with the whole uh, big mom told me I should go to church. My nana told me if I got a problem, pray about it. Pray you know, the pastor said this. Yeah. Pastor said that. Yeah, pastor don't be doing all this, you know. And um, I'm trying not to get on that <laughs> tangent about <laughs> the church and how it interferes with mental health. <laughs> but um I think it's a money grab. I did. Yeah. I'm going to say it. I think some of these churches are milking the mental health aspect as a money mm-hmm. grab. They're giving bad advice. Um, mm-hmm. And so I kind of, uh, and I started finding people who are like Christian counselors or life coaches. And mm-hmm. I even went to a Christian, when I first got, when we were engaged, I went to a Christian counselor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to say his name of the church you work with, but he, I, I believe, and my wife believes this too. He was trying to get with her. Yeah, he was trying to get with her. Yeah. Oh, um, he, he didn't. So you, so know, you was time, scarred. Huh? I said, so you was scarred. I was scarred. Yeah, like, man, this Christian counselor. And then I was like, you know, start, you know I started talking to him because I had just got a grad school. So I was, and the more he talked, this is what he would do. We'd come in, he'd put down the binder, open the binder, and literally have his finger reading. From this, I'm like, what is this guy doing? He called himself a Christian counselor, and here he is literally reading from a book to me. Yeah. And I thought I could read the book and save my waste, save my time. <laughs> you know, I was fighting prime time, tra- rush hour traffic to go to this, you mm-hmm. know, so I can get married because in, in DC you have to take marriage counseling before you can get married. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm driving out here for this, and this guy is really making a mockery of the whole mental health system. Wow. And, and on side note, he's trying to get with somebody in a minute. And then, so, you know, I tell people, I think this guy's trying to get with my wife, mm-hmm. my future wife. Yeah, future and, wife. Uh, yeah, yeah. And see, so you're not from here, but I told that story to some people who were from here, and they knew exactly who I was talking about. Okay, okay. So I was like, ask you, what made you think that? But, you know, if it's confirmed through, through, you know. Well, what made me think that he was saying things like I was, um, he would tell me, you know, he was like, okay, what difference do you have? I'm like, well, you know, I'm a little neater. 
you know, I'm a little more compulsive about certain things when it comes to like household stuff to my wife. It's like, I don't mind, I don't mind whatever. Cause mm-hmm. to me, I like, I like my house to look a certain way. Mm-hmm. So, but I like, but living with somebody else, I got to understand when well, she don't live like I live, that's her stuff too. And mm-hmm. he was like, well, why don't you just take care of her? It sounded like that song. Oh, I'll pay your bills. I wash your clothes. I cook your dinner too. As soon as you get home from work. <laughs> that was just been like, yeah, it's even like, why you don't fold her clothes for her? And I'm like, because they're her clothes. <laughs> like, well, why you don't cook dinner for her? I was like, I mean, if she asked me to, I will. I mean, I ain't going to go in there and just start firing. If there's a need, I'll feel it, you know? He mm-hmm. was like, well, I would just do it anyway. I would just, blah, blah, blah. you know, I would fold her clothes because that's what love is. I said, that's what love <laughs> is? Right? So, you know it's a problem when he starts using his personal example. So when I first started, you know. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we go, on. I'm like, all right, well, maybe maybe I took that wrong. Because he's trying to be like, I got some sort of guy, like, you go do what I'm still, doing. So, You're still learning, right? You're still learning. Right, right. I ain't never been married before. I'm going to give it a shot. So I keep mm-hmm. talking, and um, the wife is not working. At the time, she was she didn't have a job because she just got to grad school. I found work right out. So we go out there and um and so she's like, I'm looking for work. He was like, Oh, why don't you pass me your resume? You know, I can find you a spot here. I was like, You got a job for me too? Well, I don't know. I mean, we got a reception position. I don't know if we got anything for a brother with your skill set. I was like, Oh, okay. I mean, but money's money though, right? Yeah. So yeah, he like, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he was like, pass me your resume. She goes, yeah, to the church. But no, no, no. Use my Gmail account. Email me personally. Okay, yeah, that, the boundary issue. <laughs> right. So while we talking, the little two year old, you know, runs by the door. I said, oh, that's your kid. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's my kid. So then I go tell the story. I'm like, so I ask my friends, man, I don't know. This dude has my wife personal email. You want, you know, he said I'm not holding up my interview. So um, they say, you know that guy. He uh, he left his first wife. He mm-hmm. went for a younger woman. I'm like, oh, and so he was, and they were like, yeah, that kid, that's from that other woman. Got it. So you weren't crazy? No, I wasn't crazy. No, no. <laughs> and then I started thinking, wherever he got this handbook from that he's mm-hmm. literally reading from, this has been mm-hmm. going out all over the country. Okay. You know? And these people are not licensed therapists. They're just people with a book, you mm-hmm. know? And so I thought, man, there's got to be some way to relate to African-Americans without going with this Europe or Eurocentric thing. And it must be somewhere to relate to uh, black Christians or Christians in general, mm-hmm. you know, with, without, without going, trying to holler to do wife. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, and I believe the two can, you know, I believe a lot of uh, religion and science and social science do combine a lot because history repeats itself. We, we make the same mistakes. We do the same thing that people mm-hmm. do way back when to now we believe in miracles and don't believe in miracles you know so it's just a matter of if you can commit if you make the connection and a lot of times mental health and religion don't choose to make the connection mm-hmm. and so that's what i that's what made me decide to do therapy and christian counseling in general absolutely absolutely <clears throat> today we're we're talking about the topic <clears throat> kind of what the faith right and essentially how faith makes a difference in relationships and or doesn't make a difference, right? And obviously everyone's gonna have a different opinion about the role of faith in their lives and how it influences their relationship. But because you've experienced both both sides, right? Obviously as a Christian, but then second as a therapist, I, I wanna kind of dive in and really kind of get your, your perspective looking at both angles. So let's let, let's start with this statistic. And, and I've heard it floating around again. I don't know. I hadn't done the research on it myself, but there is a, a general statistic that Christians and non-Christians get divorced at around the same rate. If that's true, why why do you think that is? Uh, mainly because I guess it goes. Here you go, some uh, psycho psycho babble as I come. <laughs> it goes to a little um object relations theory. It's pretty much how you how you will first introduce to a religion, if that makes sense. Some people will see religion as just like, you know, they were raised. I've seen people who were raised with, you know, devout Christians, and then they just became atheists. They just got so burnt out with the whole experience, you know. And so it's your pers- your first introduction to any religion 
mm-hmm. that plays a factor in your relationship, not Christianity itself. Got it. Christianity don't just make you just be, you know, married for life. No, it doesn't. It just that this is what you should be doing. But, you know, if you grew up in a household where you didn't go to church at all, or if you went to church every day, that plays mm-hmm. a, that plays a factor. And that plays with anything in a relationship. How you view relationships has an effect on how you view the marriage. Mm-hmm. That's same thing with the Christianity thing. So that's why I think I don't think it really has to do with any type of um, religious faith or anything. I think it really depends on how you're introduced to that religion and how you're introduced to relationships. You put them yeah. together. Both both can be traumatic depending on your experience. Right. You know, a lot of times people talk about or when you talk about certain principles in the Bible or when you talk about Christianity and you look at even other religions, Christianity just comes to the top of the list. They look at it as something that's oppressive, particularly when it comes to the role of men and women. It's almost as if historically, it's not almost as if historically, the Bible in many ways has been used to kind of silence women. It has been used in very oppressive ways. And it doesn't mean that the Bible is oppressive, but it doesn't mean that it hasn't been used in that way. Mm-hmm. When people start to, and I'm sure it comes up in, in therapy, you know, people ask me certain things as it relates to just my opinion, perspective, et cetera. And I, and I speak very candidly on what I believe. They can take it for what it's worth. But when that topic comes up, kind of what is your response in terms of the oppressive role that Christianity has often played in relationships? Um, I just tell them, it, it could... Christianity is not the reason for that oppressive role. It could be anything, you know, it, it, that's the, that it could be narcissism. Mm-hmm. It could be um, just insecurities. And Christianity is just one of the many tools people use. And they've done it throughout history with the brigades. Mm-hmm. They've used it with slavery. They've used it, mm-hmm. you know, integration of schools. They've used it. It's yeah. just a tool just to oppress people. It's not Christianity itself. It's like, just like people say about guns, guns don't kill people. People kill people. Yeah. The same with Christianity. It's not Christianity that does these things. It's people using Christianity and people take it out of context all the time for their, for their benefit. Personal benefit. Yeah. Right. Right. And so when people do that in my, in my sessions, I tell them you took that completely out of context being completely wrong. Mm-hmm. And, I'll, and I'll tell them, you know, and I never, never put my own bias into the scripture i tell mm-hmm. people this is what it says you could i'll give you point blank what this thing says yeah i said the bible says men love your wife i don't know how so I, I ain't write that no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? is, it, is it possible to take your bias out of it because all of us bring our bias to everything to to mm-hmm. a certain extent now you always want to be mindful of that bias but can you is it is it even possible to be completely objective? No, because it is based on it's not like math. Mm-hmm. You know, math two plus two, two plus two equals four, four, right? No matter who does it, there's no matter <laughs> background. But I do have some bias, so I try to watch my bias when I go into, the, especially when it comes to religions outside of Christianity. Mm-hmm. I try to keep my bias out of it, and uh, the way I do it, I take a more historical approach. This is what happened in history. This is you know. Like, um, for example, I have the uh, the Quran around here somewhere. I don't know how I did with it. And I have the Dom, I have the Quran, I have the Dhamma Pot. I don't know how I did. Oh, there's the Quran. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let me get it. Hold on. Just like I can show you. I did. Actually, I'm not saying I don't have these. I do have the Quran in my house. <laughs> okay. Right. And uh, I don't know how I did with the Dhamma Pot, but that is uh, from Buddhism. And so, I, oh, it's over there. I don't feel like going over again, but it's, no, it's all good. I believe, <laughs> but I, but the thing is, with Christianity, I try to tell people that um, it's not me. You know, it's history, mm-hmm. it's scripture. You know, mm-hmm. it is also psychology. Mm-hmm. So I mean, but if they if they want to, am I biased? You know, a point to certain way, but I'd never be like take this one verse. Don't read beyond that verse. <laughs> I'm like, read anything that came before. Don't read anything that came anything after. after. Just read that one verse. I'm Don't even worry about what was going on at that time in that particular. Yeah, just, right. just read this and trust me. 
Right, yeah, yeah. And you know what? It's funny you say that because I've heard ministers do that or deacons do that. And I've taken that verse, went back and read it. I was like, nah, man, you take that completely out of context. Yeah. You know? And so that kind of, that's where the, that's where the bias comes in because now I have this jaded issue where mm-hmm. it's hard for you to trust just any type of verse. Yeah. You know? Like I had a minister tell me one time, but he, he said he was a minister. <laughs> you, 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 didn't, you didn't do the fact check on him. <laughs> no, I mean, it ain't like they got some database, you know, people, people would call themselves apostles and like, that is impossible. Yeah. Unless you were 2,000 years old, you are not an apostle, <laughs> right? Hey, you never know. You never know. <laughs> nah, that's, that's clear definition. But anyway, let me stop. <laughs> get me going. So that's my idea. It's like, I have to take my jaded practice out of it. Mm-hmm. My jaded mm-hmm. thoughts of my own religion out and put more science and history into it. And yeah. that's what I try to do to avoid the bias is put history behind it. This, this is unrelated, but a lot of people, at least, I, I man, a lot of people I see have been, are very jaded. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes we used to call it church hurt, but a lot of times it's, as you said earlier, you have these negative experiences and it just creates a bad taste. It may not even be with a church. It could be with someone who is vocal about being a Christian or vocal about being a Muslim, whatever, right? Mm. And they do something that is contrary to what it is that they say. And you just turn away from it altogether. Right. How do you, if if at all, you you may not, right? Because depending on what they come to you for, if it's for drugs and alcohol, it's like, hey, man, we need, we need to focus on the drug use before we right. get sidetracked. <laughs> Let's take yeah. care of the drug first. Right. Uh, but... How do you reconcile that? When they're contradicting what they, their well, own. When their experience is, hey, I believe this, but I don't do this because of this one experience. Or they use kind of anecdotal information to say, well, this is why I do this, right? Yeah. When you still acknowledge the, the hurt that they may have experienced, but at the same time, you do want to be encouraging not to kind of walk away from something that may have been a source of hope for them. Right, right. So I asked them, you know, where did you get this? Is this scripture that you're just talking or is this a scripture that a minister gave to you? Mm-hmm. You know, and then I tried to I always start with trying to break. I, I always try to get their understanding of scripture or their understanding of the Bible. I don't just go in and like they already know about Noah. They yeah. already know about, you know, this because that was the thing I had issue I had growing up myself. You know, mm-hmm. they, every every church, every day, every Sunday, every Sunday, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. You know, but if you're eight years old, that doesn't make a lick of sense to you. <laughs> yeah. well, how does these, I ain't never seen him. How is he saving me? Mm-hmm. And they just assume that the person knows what you mean. Mm-hmm. They, I, I don't know what that means. And I'm not the only eight year old. If I'm eight, how are these adults? Did I miss this Sunday? And then ever, mm-hmm. that's what I'm thinking. Are they ever going to go back around to the topic of how he saved them? And they yeah. never do. You know, it, it was so funny. It's a random story. My daughter, <clears throat> when she was younger, we were um, we were talking about you know Christmas, you know, just going through some different things. She said, "Man, Jesus just had a birthday." <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, and we were laughing, but just to your point, you 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 have to have context. Right, yeah. right. You, you and churches don't pick up on the context, and so when people mm-hmm. come to me, I have to see what context they have so I can build on that. I'm like, yeah. okay, let me let me work in the world that you live in, the your view of religion. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, so from there, I'm like, well, that's interesting that you think that way, because that's not what the Bible actually says. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not the intention of the Bible, mm-hmm. you know. And then so then sometimes I'm like, and that, that's why I tell them all the time, I'm going to give you the verse. I'm not going to give you one line either. I'm going to give you the whole chapter, okay. give you the whole thing, you know, and you can read. And I can take away and go to research it, you know, and to me. Any true clergy, any true therapist, any true teacher, anybody who is supposed to extend spiritual growth or intellectual growth should be willing to be challenged. Mm -hmm. It should never be just take my word for it. Mm -hmm. You know, and to me, a true religion is one that can be challenged every day and it will stand up every day. Just like science and math, math the same way. Every day you challenge that formula, it's going to work. That's just how, to me, that's how religion should be. I shouldn't be able, someone shouldn't be able to come up and start poking holes for religion. Yeah. And so if they start doing that, then I'm like, okay, somebody told you wrong. Yeah. And I go speaking back to that. 
speaking speaking of uh challenge let's let's talk about marriage because because <laughs> that's probably the most challenging thing in many ways aside from maybe raising kids that that most of us experience is being in this long-term relationship with one person right that's that's super challenging how has faith right when you think about just your role as a, as a father as a husband has there has there been any parts of your own beliefs that have been hard to live up to forgiveness um you know being faithful like what what have you struggled with most in the context of your marriage um the, the, how long you been married let's start there first how long uh, you been married well, <laughs> that's the next question, especially in during Christian counseling, and put put it in terms as I grew up to learn. Me and my <laughs> wife were living in sin. <laughs> for about eight years. We were shagging up for about eight years. <laughs> Before we got married, and now we've been married about 14 years since then. Okay. You know, and my wife, she'll say, Man, once we got married, phew, the blessings started coming in. I'm like, I guess. <laughs> Which blessing are we talking about? <laughs> right. I tell you all about, but yeah, we, we so down. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny because this is how strong our individual faiths were. We were so adamant and we had our baggage. And I'll say baggage, I don't mean like boyfriend, girlfriend baggage. I mean like growing up, seeing divorce, mm -hmm. how that affects kids. We had that type of divorce baggage that we were running from marriage because we did not want it to end in divorce. Not mm -hmm. because we didn't want to get married. We just like, well, like me, I grew up in a neighborhood, everybody was a single mom to the point when I went to kindergarten. Only people I knew living in the most days out loud sound again, dumb. The only people I knew black that lived in the same bed were the Jeffersons. <laughs> you know, all the people I saw on TV, <laughs> you know, you know, like, hey, uh, this is what I see. I don't know what right. you see, but yeah, after this, uh, single dad, <laughs> you know. So that's how we both grew up, and we both grew up with this trauma of divorce that we brought with to each other to the point that we were afraid to get married because mm -hmm. we didn't want to end the divorce. Mm -hmm. So it took us a while to overcome and say, you know what, this is what we're going to do. That's what made it so hard about going to Christian counseling. Like, look, we done put off this fear for so long, and now here we come into the house of the Lord. And this is the welcome we get. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's it's tough. It, it, it is because you you, you kind of wrestle through your own doubt, your own fears. And then here it is, you get to a place where you're supposed to feel safe and, and be able to just kind of be completely transparent. Mm -hmm. But what ends up happening is it's almost re-injures some of the original hurt that may have been right. created. Right. We leave counsel thinking... Yeah, we yeah. Count, we may end up in divorce after all because I don't iron your clothes for work. You mm -hmm. know, I don't yeah. pick up behind you and I'm not going to pick up behind you. You know, if that's yeah. going to be a deal breaker, that may be an issue, <laughs> right? So we brought that baggage. And so we've been married like 14 years, lived in San for like eight before that. <laughs> so yeah. collectively- well, you're, not, you're not the only one, so- let me Right, right. Like, I, I ain't the only one and I'm not going to be the last one either. But no. yeah. But what was, the, what was the turning point for you? In terms of you both had this fear of getting divorced, so you avoided marriage, but then you finally decide, let's go ahead and take that leap. Uh, because fear was the only thing standing in the way. Okay. Space and opportunity were taken care of. We both had the money, we both had jobs. We both well, she didn't have a job. Um, <laughs> we have both been together this long. Mm -hmm. There really, in my mind, there was no justification to continue. The way it was going yeah since you since you've been married this is this is off topic a little bit but since you've been married for 14 years and you you had this fear of getting married what has been most surprising as it relates to what you originally believed about marriage or what it would be um the roles you mm -hmm. know i grew up in like i have uncles they can't cook toast they can't mm -hmm. And they don't even go, they don't even go, they go to the dining room table. They do not go in the kitchen unless they walk into the dining room table. And mm -hmm. wife bring them with food. I had one uncle, he told his wife, they, they maybe was 17, and he told her, I don't want you working. And he worked two jobs his, mm -hmm. her entire life. But she never worked. And and that was always a big matzo ball for me. I'm like, what if he would have died first? 
<laughs> like no work experience. <laughs> so um, that I guess would be my surprise. Like I don't really care about the roles as much as I thought my upbringing would make me care about it. And okay. I'm surprised that how much I personally put in family loyalty, mm. you know, whereas like divorce is like with her mom and my mom, they were quick to be like, you know, hyphenate your name or, you know, have some money put away for the rainy day. You know, that kind of mindset, you know, like my mom right now, she'll write my wife and it have her maiden name and my last name mm-hmm. had 14 years. <laughs> Sound like my mom. Right, yeah, yeah. And so her mom did one time her mom Hey mama, don't be telling her that you're supposed to be on my side. You know, she's like, You're not telling me because you never know. Hey, whoa. Yeah, yeah. And that was her mom's same way. Like we were trying to get a house and her mom's in finance. And um her mom wanted to uh you know help us get a loan. So she helped Mm -hmm. helped run the credit. And after we got after we got the house been there two years, I go to our house, her computer broke. I still see my financial information on her computer. Yeah. I'm like, why, why she still got my financial stuff? Not not her daughter's stuff. Yeah. My stuff. Right? Because you never know. You never know. <laughs> right. So, you got it because you never know. <laughs> you never know. And so I learned that their perspective isn't as they don't see the same loyalty. And a lot of my clients he said, I'll leave this person. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Whereas my perspective, no, we can't leave. I go by a leveling philosophy that I haven't, I didn't think I would. Mm-hmm. And leveling is a more psycho babble about like how you see the relationship. Yeah. Um, it comes down, if you don't mind, leveling is kind of like is the idea that, like, for example, I guess leveling is where you get to the mind point, mindset where you think divorce is not an option. Or like mm-hmm. if you're on an island, for example, this, this is the, the example I've heard. Of leveling, if you get put on a deserted island with your significant other, if you know the boat is coming back to pick you up, you will act differently than if you know you're out there for an uh, extended amount of time, for mm-hmm. unknown amount of time. You will work together if you know you're out there possibly for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. So I try to take that perspective of leveling, like, no, this is forever. I got to make this work. We're on this island forever. But some people think, no, that boat can come back around. I still got it. I can get out there. Yeah. So, so, some people got a boat docked on the back end. Right, just in case, right. And they got a map they hide in their pocket. Oh, they ain't gone anywhere. Like, they still... <laughs> right. So let me ask you this. You know, I hear a lot of people, um, and, and I don't say a lot of people, but I, I, a handful, you know, who are dating and they come to counseling. And for me, one of the things that's super important is that we establish um, a, an understanding of what one another values. And the value is always tricky because it's it's not a sexy conversation. You know, people want to first a lot of times we want to get into immediately problem solving. You know, he did this, she did that. But then a lot of times we don't want to kind of peel back the layers and say, what do I really value? Like, what is most important? Like if this person only had one, two and three, like what are those things for me? Mm -hmm. When it comes to the faith value. A lot of times people say, yes, faith is important to me. Faith is important to my spouse and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what should people be looking for? Because, again, it, it, it sounds the same, but there's so much diversity within just that one word. How do you know people are aligned in terms of what it is they believe from a faith perspective when they're dating and they say that this is something that they both value? Um. I guess for what I do, people say this is I try to ask them to list all their values, list top 10 values in the other person, whether it be, if you want that person to be heavy set, you want them to be, you can be as shallow as you want. Top Mm -hmm. 10 things, you know, then I make them knock those 10 things down to five things, Mm -hmm. you know? And so once they, even to five, they start going, okay, but maybe money ain't that big a deal. Or I say, okay, knock it down to three, you know? And mm-hmm. for some reason, they do that. Religion is not part of their top three. Mm. You know, it may be on the list, but it's yeah. not top three. Yeah, top three is like don't lie to me. You know, uh, commit. You know, or it's like th- these are the something like that. But it's it's rarely there's religion. So it's always like, well, take a good look at 
how a priority your religion because a lot of people they're like, I want my man to take care of me. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, that's not a religious thing. Yeah. But like you said about people use the Bible, people use religion to be like, my my ethics are based on my religious view. Mm-hmm. And no, they just happen to be a coincidence that your ethics line up with religious religion. Mm-hmm. But no, really, that's just your view. That's yeah. your value. You know, and so when they get that top three, I'm like, these are the core things that are important to you. Mm-hmm. You know. Do you think it's a deal breaker if someone is in a relationship or pursuing marriage and the person is not a Christian or if someone is not of the same faith? So if you had a Muslim and a Catholic, a Muslim and a Christian, a Catholic and a Muslim, do you think that that's something that would create conflict in their relationship later on down the line? Or say someone was a strong believer. This is probably what I experienced most. Someone who's like, hey, I'm this. And the other person says, I don't necessarily subscribe to any religion or faith or anything like that. Do you think they can still make it work? Um, Yeah. Yeah, they can still make it work. It's going to be, it, it really, it's going to be very difficult, you know, for that aspect. It's going to be, mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to be conflict about that. Mm-hmm. But then it goes right back to what I said before about how you you create this dichotomy and then you just want to be polarized on this subject instead of looking at what do the two religions have in common? Mm-hmm. You know, they, they both, like if it were to be Islam and Christianity, they both say you submit to the Lord. You know, mm-hmm. they, but people get away from that. They say women should wear this. Women should wear that. Uh, well, now you kind of take them. Both not well, it's one thing if you take one religion out of context, now you take two out of context, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, it's like yes, it says that, but does it also just say say submit to the Lord? You know, it's fairly simple. I tell you all the time, you know, you go through your list of whatever is in the Kabbalah, whatever is in that, but you look at the bare bones of every religion, all of them say you gotta love, you gotta, love that neighbor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> These little simple, basic, absolute zero things, you know, but all religions have now complicated. Mm-hmm. You know, made it way more difficult than it had to be. Well, you got to pray this way five times. Okay, well, I could pray five times as a Christian. Mm-hmm. I, can, I can pray in any direction I want to pray in. I, there was a uh, Buddhist guy. He was like, yeah, I'm Buddhism. You know, I like to meditate. I said, Jesus meditated in the garden. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. Say, you can't meditate. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But people start clouding these religions. Well, this is what it means. And they don't want to mix with that. Mm-hmm. You're getting away from your own religion now. You know, one of the things that gets thrown around, and this is, and I'm getting specific within Christian faith, is you hear people talk about being equally yoked, Mm -hmm. right? Can't be with someone not equally yoked. In in your opinion, let's say they both are Christians, but one still feels like they're unequally yoked. What do you, what does that mean? You know, it's funny you ask me. That's the same question I asked them. What's that mean? Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, yoked. I said, well, what's a yoke? What do you mean even yoked? Break mm-hmm. that down for me. Yeah. You know, and then sometimes they were like, it means like we are balanced or this or that, or, you know, like, no, tell me what does evenly yoked mean? Because your definition, I need to know. Yeah. Like with anything, you know, you got to know that person. So when they break down, what does it mean? They say, oh, even, I said, you even know what yoke, I said, because the, the Bible is, uses yoked in our modern language. It looks like it's a verb. Mm-hmm. Right, but a yoke is actually a noun, and so I tell people, look up yoke, and they say, "Why well, no egg yolk?" <laughs> nah, <laughs> see, that's not right. I said <laughs> egg yolk. Yes, that's true, but you think the Bible means you get the same two eggs because no two eggs are alike? That's mm-hmm. impossible. So no, they do not mean you get a scale and balance two yolks. Mm-hmm. And I, then if they give me what they think, I tell them, you know what, you've been spouting that verse around forever. Oh, yeah. And most of the time we do. Right. Because we we don't a lot of times we don't investigate ourselves. We don't research ourselves. We just right. adopt what was told to us. And well, sometimes it works. You can't Jesus say, OK, if you say he did, I guess he did. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it works for us. Right. But sometimes it doesn't work for us and we continue to force it. And so, right. yeah. And so what I tell people, once we go through this whole thing, of defining what a yoke is, same way define what a sin is, because. Mm-hmm. A lot of times we connect these terms to religion. And I tell people these these are contemporary terms used by the people of the time. Mm-hmm. That means what they meant by sin 
is not the same thing that society and anthropology has evolved what we think it is now. So I was like, what is it saying? They say, okay, well, sin is when you do something wrong against God. I said, bare bones, that's not what a sin is. You sin against God. The sin mm-hmm. itself, it means miss the mark. Mm-hmm. That's totally different because that's just missing a mark. Yeah. But they don't, they don't focus on it. They think the word sin means I've hurt God. No, the word sin means you've missed the mark. It's the archery term because mm-hmm. back then they had guns. They have bows and arrow, <laughs> right? So when you sin against God, I mean, you just miss the mark that God has set for you. Not that you're a bad person or you're evil or whatever, but you got to take that bare bones definition. Same way with evilly yoked. You have to take the bare bones definition of what a yoke is. So I say the yoke is the thing that two cows carry around their neck and they, they struggle and plow through the field, you know, and it makes a productive crop. If mm-hmm. one cow is not pulling their weight, the yoke will unbalance. Now it's not evenly yoked, but that doesn't mean at some point in your marriage, that person may pick up some stuff here. Prime example, like this uh, COVID, right? Mm-hmm. My wife was in grad school. I worked. She didn't go to work. That's when she had no job went to college. She didn't get work until like a year after we got married, right? Mm-hmm. I was pulling the load. I was dragging around, pulling, you know, yeah. then she climbed the rank. She started getting work and started doing this. Then COVID hits. I started losing work. I started losing money. Mm-hmm. Now it's her turn to start pulling the yoke. <laughs> yeah. Right? We are evenly yoked. At some point, we are balanced. Sometimes we're perfectly balanced. Sometimes the other person has to do a little more, do a little mm-hmm. less. It's uh it's but the thing is you are both working together to mm-hmm. through the struggle. I tell people think of being evenly yoked is like life is work, and this person is your co-worker. You know, you are working together through life. Mm-hmm. Therefore, you need to be both have the same skill set and the same, you know, some things got to be, you can even, not say skill set, I meant like emotional intelligence, dealing with coping, you know, these kind of, and this is where the yoke comes in mm-hmm. because you are doing work together. No one is doing work for the other person. No one's doing work without the other person. Everything you do balances out with the other person they do. And this is in Old Testament and New Testament. If you mm-hmm. go to, um, if you go to Proverbs, it's in there about the woman of virtue. It talks about being evenly yoked. Where yeah. the guy, the guy, it's so like if you're a shopkeeper, I'm paraphrasing because I'm not an ordained minister, but I, I read, it, I read it, okay? So <laughs> they says, a little something, something, you know. a little something, right, right. I've been to church enough to get yeah. kicked out, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, it says that the woman of virtue replaces the man in his store while he goes to the gate, goes to meet with the elders, goes to war. But for her to replace him, she has to be just as knowledgeable as he is in that area. Mm-hmm. That's where the evenly yoke comes in. You know, and so that's people take it out of context. And so it's really about, can this person be you when you can't be you? Can you yeah. be that person when you can't? When that person's mama dies, can you take on that emotional struggle? When your mom dies, can she take on that emotion? That's the evenly yoke. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's good. That's good. Because again, even just listening, I'm like, oh, yeah, we definitely take it out of context a lot of times. Because yeah. it comes up, right? And then people will come to me and say, and, and they'll use it, and not even intention. I don't, I don't think people have any mal intent when they do it. But sometimes they feel a certain way, not because they personally feel that way, but it's because they subscribe to this belief and it's almost become a, a reality that may not even be their reality. It may have been your mom's reality, your grandparents' reality. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, Rashad, I, I appreciate you joining on this episode. Tell tell people where they can find you at, what new projects you got working on. If someone wants to get in contact with you, how do, how do they do it? Um, they can find me on Instagram at, at that's.helpful. Um, they could Google my name, Scott Skinner, it comes up. Um, they can, what else can they, they can email me, um, always more at sapphiretherapy.com. And, but they can just call me. I mean, but yeah, if you Google me, you'll find my stuff also. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Currently, um, I am getting a <clears throat> the counseling thing is still there, but now I'm getting into schools and I'm trying to do this HBCU prep program. That's what the shirt sees is Black God Just Matter. You okay. Know? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. The idea is to connect HBCUs to students locally who do who can't afford those thousands of dollar bu- bus trips to go all around the South. Okay. You know, and I, and I found out schools and students are being done. This is just just because they can't get to these 
they just can't make the connection. Mm-hmm. So the I <clears throat> so the premise is that virtually the schools visit each week in the in the schools at these um like in their homeroom class or whatever and okay. seniors and juniors sit in they get they do this kind of powwow we're doing here except with okay. a college recruiter they get to go on a virtual bus tour that they otherwise couldn't afford and i couldn't afford it and in fact the hbcu i went to i didn't hear about it until the second semester of my senior year wow what, yeah, what, H- I, H- what hc what what <laughs> hcbu was it just for oh, people out there i'm yeah. glad you asked <laughs> Let me get my bag. Everyone that doesn't know that. Oh, no. Oh, no. I put up something down. Okay, I went to Fisk University in Nashville. Yeah, I know. Please, I can't please don't hold it against them. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I know the mug upside down. There we go. I'm you know we're serious when we got the mug. <laughs> yeah, oh, man, it was upside down. I'm sorry, school. I, all yeah, ain't no one's perfect, right? <laughs> Hey, you missed the mark. <laughs> right, right. Look, I got it everywhere. Here you go. Look, there. That's right. Miss University. <laughs> hey, next is a tattoo. <laughs> so. No, nah, I ain't no tattoo now. Nah. But I do have <laughs> enough. Is, that's the Jubilee Singer is right here. You know, okay. that's that little square right there. That's mm-hmm. the stamp of W.E.B. Du Bois. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was a stamp. Yeah, they didn't yeah. Yeah, you got to see him on a stamp. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. He's he's the so the he's idea, here. the reason Shut why I'm so, <laughs> Say what? I said, shout out to Fisk. Shout out to Fisk, yes. Because that degree made a difference in how other schools, I, pretty much I tell you, I was the stone that the potter refused. Mm. And Fisk was the one that opened the door. It's like, you know what? You've been through, you do a, you do a lot of misdoings, but we're going to give you give you one shot at this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Other schools are like, no, you ain't getting any shot at this. No, you are yeah. not Hampton caliber. You are not, you know, Tuskegee material, mm-hmm. you know. So if those schools want to turn me on, I mean, I still, you know, help them recruit, whatever, HBC, whatever. But um, Fisk is always going to be the one I'm going to push first. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, because when they, people had the chance, they slept on me. And so here I am. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, but now that I'm putting this project out, so more kids, because I'm, my story is not unique. Um, mm-hmm. There are a lot of kids who have not heard of Fisk, not heard of Taldego, Tougaloo. And mm-hmm. so I think it's injustice that these kids never heard of these schools simply because the, school, the schools don't play on ESPN. The schools don't play on, you know, ABC, SEC Sunday. Yeah. You know, it's injustice that they don't get to hear about these schools and these schools are equal caliber or better than a lot of you know, the other schools, yeah. Right, right. So my, my goal is to, if nothing else, get these schools on your radar. Um, mm-hmm. If they don't want to go to, you know, Grambling or Southern, I can live with that. But I, I can't live with them not going to Lane or not going to Kentucky State because they ain't never heard of it. Got it. You know? That makes sense. So let me ask you this last question. With the counseling, is this two parts? I want to ask on the counseling and I also want to uh, ask on the college initiative that you have going. Yeah. From a counseling perspective, who should reach out? Is it... Uh, I, I, I tell my wife, she's like, who's your clientele? To, just like Walmart, anybody off the street, you would never know that they were clients of mine. I don't okay. I don't have any particular um, say. I don't I mean, I never say like, no, I'm gonna turn this person away. But the clientele ranges from at least I want to say my youngest client is like 14. OK, and my oldest client in my groups is like 65. OK, you know, um, I take insurance. Um, take obviously out of pocket but there is no no clear cut client that yeah, I, I yeah absolutely so if you're just in need or you want to talk to a therapist a qualified therapist not not the past that we talked about at the beginning that's going to slide in oh. your, your 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 wife email but a qualified therapist definitely reach out to Richard and on the college initiative who should reach out should the mom reach out should the school counselor reach out who should contact you about this uh this is the pilot program um, I would love for the counselor to reach out because then I could just we could implement implement it in the school day, like they're doing Klein Kane and Klein Collins and Klein um Forrest. Uh okay. but if not, you know, the parent can contact me, the kid can contact me. And if they can't get into the initiative, I can surely give them the recruiters that are going to be in the initiative. Okay. You know, the idea is that with this program this year, I would have 
what happened, I tried to write for funding and I didn't get any for it because a lot of people were saying, this is not a fundable project. We don't see the endeavor growing. We don't know if this is, you know, something that will work. So my thing now is to get this thing to grow so that I can say this works. It is a need. Absolutely. Because right now I'm paying for this whole thing out of pocket, looking for sponsors, donors, restaurants. I can have a fundraiser. Yeah. Um, but, and with, with enough participation in this part, I can justify the need. And I have proven, res- proven results to secure Absolutely. the sponsorship. You know, and so that's the thing. Because um, right now, when I wrote the argument, the same, we don't see it serving a need. So mm-hmm. this is data gathering. Because the okay. long-term goal is to give schools the, pi- the same pipelines I have at UT and A&M, mm-hmm. right, where the pr- program be duplicated each year, where people in high school can be in it. And it'll become like, just a resource and we could do it outside of school later on in the evening. And people just know I could go on these tours and not be super rich to do it. I don't have to have, a, I don't have to have a bus or a Greek organization to fund me or a church to pay for a bus. I can do this from home. Membership for me, membership does not have its privilege. Like I said, I was stoned at, pot, at the pot of refuse. So I've always been anti you know, oh, you got to be in this organization to get it, or you got to go to this church to be down. Mm-hmm. I've, no, I've never. That's why I was like, I help anybody who needs it. Um, okay. I don't need to be affiliated with any organization or church mm-hmm. or whatever. If you if you need it, you know, I'll figure a way to make it work. I mean, I'll yeah. find a way. To, I'll I'll find a way to eat. But yeah. <laughs> the main thing is, will you find a way to eat? <laughs> yeah, you know? and that's what you're doing. You you helping bridge that gap. Hey, Rashad, I appreciate you. Obviously, beyond just this this podcast, I appreciate everything you've done, even just for me professionally, personally. Oh. Right? I mean, me and Rashad talk, and just people don't know, at least every other week. Like, we yeah. you know, I'm, I'm good for a good meal if you get a little slow, you know. So yeah, yeah. I, I definitely appreciate that. Everyone, stay tuned. Everything he mentioned will be in the show notes. And tune back in for another episode of Untherapeutic.